miigwech. Hanigana. Bojo, Heidi Burns Indigenous Cause, Mississauga and Donjaba, Michi Territory and Da. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Heidi Burns. I'm your moderator for today's webinar. I am so grateful and excited to welcome you today and to introduce you to our esteemed panelists as we gather for the first part of this year's Pine Tree Talks live webinar series, Monoman the Good Seed. We join you all today from Michi Saugig and Anishinaabeg territory, covered by Treaty 20 and Williams Treaty. Our event happens to coincide with Treaties Recognition Week in Ontario. It was originally designated in 2016 for the purpose of honoring the treaties and encouraging Ontarians to better learn about and engage with their own treaty relationships. On behalf of Trent University, Chani Wenjak School for Indigenous Studies and Pine Tree Talks organizers, we offer our gratitude to the Michi Sagi and as the first caretakers of this territory for their teachings of the earth, water, and all our relations. May we honor our treaty relationships and the relationships we receive together today. Chimi Gwech, a big thank you to our guest speakers coming virtually together today from our respective remote lo locations in Michisagi territory. And to all of you, our guests joining us from all across Northern Turtle Island. Panelists will do a brief Q&A at the end of the webinar. So please be sure to submit your questions uh, throughout the talk. It's now my huge privilege to introduce our panelists, three truly inspirational leaders who have been my teachers, who have humbly supported me in my own work, and who have been my friends in community. Elder, knowledge keeper, hand drummer and singer, and founder of the Sacred Water Circle, Dorothy Taylor. I need Elder. <laughs> I need Dorothy. Elder, knowledge keeper, uh, traditional harvester, author and director of the Indigenous Studies PhD program, Gidiga Megaze. I need. <laughs> I need. Academic, writer, musician, and the Noman Harvester, Dr. Leanne Pedasumasage Simpson. Anin. Anin Kinawaya. Anin. I now warmly welcome our first speaker, who we heard singing the opening Monoman song, Dorothy Taylor, who will talk to us about that song that she sang with us now. Oh, sure. Anin, <laughs> bonjour. And then dog nak nim ki kop and as she quendish na cause wabagog do dem. Uh to me gwatch ga gibishai sonongum gitchenandem ga um gitchenandem ga um mean ga uh na gum wood menomen should call that. Um that song that I sang at the first is uh it took me a while to come up with that song because when I was a young young child young girl like we're talking uh you know 10 or 11. uh my dad we we would always um gather rice so he would take us out on the canoe and we'd we'd have our our, our sticks and we would gather the rice and uh he was very good at stories and he was so good at uh at singing and so uh when we we'd actually sometimes we would he would like to bring we would go to uh lovesick lake up by burley falls there uh, my family had like a trapping trapping uh, cabin that we turned into a family cottage really and we would go there and he would bring his um bring the bring the rice that we gathered and uh, we'd go up to the top where the skull rock is and um he would he would say now girls let's let's dance the rice and he would sing this song to me and uh, it took me a while to remember it, how it went. I just remember him singing it to us. Um, my dad's name was uh, Fred McHugh, and his Nishnabad name is Banashwe Gizis Bun. He passed away about, geez, 2010 actually, so 10 years ago. And so when we were up at top at the Skull Rock, we would put on our moccasin on, and then we would dance that, uh, dance to that music that he'd sing to us. Yeah, so in English, that song says, um, "Oh, the the uh, beautiful Menomen, 
you're in the ribbon stage. So when you saw the pictures at the beginning of the slideshow, you saw those pictures uh, of the menom and how it was uh, like the plants were laying right on the, on the water surface. My dad used to call that the ribbon stage. So that's what that menom and zenabanyak means. And then it says, Mikoa den daguse, you're so beautiful. And then, uh, then, we, then the last part is, is um, then you're going to be standing up soon. That's what it's at, at the last part says. So it was fun, fun song. We used to laugh because me, me and my sister Donna, we'd be, uh, we could be kind of like shy dancing on the rice, but we'd ha have a good laugh. So that's what it's all about, really. When we're gathering that menomen, menomen means the good rice. It brings the families together. It brings out laughter. It brings out the songs and we dance. And uh, we sure did. We used to dance that rice and have a good old time. Yeah, and my dad, and I, he wanted me to sing that song at a powwow someday. So maybe someday I'll be able to do that Curve Lake. Yeah. Yeah, so that was fun. That's just a, a memory. And I, and I sang that song. Uh, the group that's uh, working towards uh, uh, the Pigeon Lake, you know, you know, there's a bit of a commotion on Pigeon Lake because a lot of our rice has come back there. And uh, so we've been getting together four times throughout the, the Menomen season. And I introduced that song at one of our sunrise ceremonies to pray for that rice because the work that we're doing for that rice, it's sacred food. It's a sacred rice. And sacred means that it has a, a connection to the higher power, creator God, Geshem and so that's why we include that rice at our, all our, our ceremonies and our, our feasts. And when we are doing that work on Pigeon Lake, um, we wanted to do it in a good way. And that means doing everything beginning with prayer and song. And just be gentle, kind people. This is how we want to work in that, in that regards. So basically that's... That's what I wanted to share with you about that song that we had. Uh, that's, thanks for asking me uh, and, and playing that song with those, that slideshow. It was really nice. To me, Gwach. Nahab me, yeah. Me, Gwach, Dorothy. Sorry for the um, glitch there. My, my camera froze. Did it. <laughs> Miigwech so much for sharing with us. Oh, today. you're welcome. We're so, so grateful to have you. Thank you. I would now like to introduce uh, Gidiga Megaze and Leanne Betasomasake Stinson to um, offer a conversation about Monoman with us today. Anin. Anin. Thank you Anin. both for being with us today. I will pass the, the mic over to you now. Miigwech. Gidigab Ajuna Denawema, Kinega Chia Nishnabek, Ogaming Na Donjaba, Nagojawani Megwadoda, Bidasamuse, Nadishna Kaz. Um, I'm so grateful to, to be here today, and I'm so grateful that Doug and Dorothy are uh, brilliant at the Zoom and um, are able to, to uh, be with us today. That song was just, um, just brought tears to my eyes, Dorothy, and, and seeing your face um, smile so big when you talked about your memories on A Love Sick Lake was just so beautiful. Um, I'm also really thankful to to Lynn and and Heidi and the whole the whole pine tree um, group of people that has um, maneuvered and pivoted to to make this webinar possible. I, it's so amazing to see so many people here and so many people that when I was just scrolling through the chat that I haven't seen for two decades. Imagine if we were all in the same room. Um, we've had lots and lots of practices, so. It's going to all be so smooth. And I'm so, so lucky and feel so grateful to be here with, with you, Doug. Um, I've learned so much over the past two decades 
from you um, about the rice. And um, I feel so, every time I've, I've ever been out on the lake in the canoe or dancing it on your lawn or burning it on your lawn, <laughs> there's been a lot of um, laughter and a lot of fun. And so I'm really happy that, that you're here uh, with us today too. I wanted to start, Doug, by just getting you to take us back to a time before colonization, before the settlers, before the farms, before the Trent Severn Waterway. And can you just tell us what our territory and our homeland was like? Can you tell us what the rice was like and the importance of us, the, of the rice to, to our societies? Can you start us off just giving us a, a glimpse of what it was like? Uh, yeah, uh, Jimmy Gwetch, uh, first of all, uh, for asking me to be here on this webinar. I, I'm kind of, kind of humbled by it, and and I would just like to also thank the organizers for all the work they've put into this. It's uh, made it so easy uh, to come in and uh, and uh, be with a. Uh, many more people during these times of uh, uh, difficult times, these great disease we've, uh, we're facing. Uh, so, and people have, have you know, uh, we miss each other. So uh, it's, it's good that we're able to get together. Uh, my name is Gidega Migizi. Uh, and, uh, and I'm from the Curb Lake First Nation. And my clan is a Pike clan, so it's it's good to be with you. Pike in Nishnabe is Kanoje. It's uh, it's been with us. Uh, in fact, one of my relatives lived around the uh, Coldwater Portage. That was the last one to carry the uh, both the clan name, and he also was called every day uh, Mesh Kanoje which is a uh, Mashkanoja means rare pike. But I also would like to kind of point out certain people in my life. It's really quite an honor to have a number of people listening. And it's always good to honor people that uh, are significant uh, and so on. Uh, I don't want to uh, yet mention some of the older ones. I just want to mention some of the newer ones that have been a big influence. And also uh, uh, feel greatness that uh, people listen, and 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 uh, and also believe in what I'm saying. And so, uh, one of them is I, I want to mention Christine C, uh, who kind of jump started me a little bit in terms of there was a period of time when I was sort of pretty quiet. Uh, quietly doing this on my own. Uh, so in the last two decades, uh, many people have sort of stepped up and learned uh, these things of the land that uh, I think that we should keep, we should insist on, and so on. And also working with the language. So she's, uh, I have to thank her. I have to thank Julie Kapirka, who has been working uh, diligently with me. We've uh, published about four articles, plus uh, I've just finished a foreword on an archaeological book written by Bill Finlinson about Ontario archaeology. And Bill has, uh, has really written quite a story about the peopling of Ontario, which is in line with the way I think. And uh, so many, many thanks to Bill. Of course, Chimigwetch to uh, to Leanne. Of course, I I shouldn't forget Leanne, but uh, uh, nor nor am I not. I'm not placing the people here in a in a in a in a way that I would uh, uh, kind of uh, you know like there's number one, number two, number three. I'm not trying to do that. But Chimigwetch to Leanne for all the work she's put into uh, uh, getting back some of our old ways and uh, or revitalizing it or re 
rejuvenating it or whatever you want to call it and it's uh, it's been quite the uh, it's been quite the journey for both of us uh, I'd like to also point out uh, about the support I've been getting from the Bob Cajun TRC they've worked really hard uh, they really take it seriously to be our allies and I I uh, can't get over sometimes the effort they put into it and the support they give me and the energy they give me. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not the best of health anymore and I've really slowed up physically. And they've been very understanding of all that. And uh, at one point in time, a couple of them even loaded me up in a canoe and uh, went paddling and went for a walk at the, uh, at the uh, Chimney Sing, which is Big Island on Pigeon Lake. I appreciate uh, that kind of thing. Then of course the Manuman group in Peterborough area who work hard and are also attached to the uh, organizers of the Pine Tree Talks. Uh, should also mention, of course, Chief and Council of Curb Lake who are um, young, uh, bright, energetic and put a lot of effort and understanding into this. Uh, uh, it's that they find out, uh, uh, they're finding out a lot about wild rice, they're young. Uh, uh, it's unfortunate that, uh, that our young people don't get the cultural knowledge that they probably um, uh, would have been a good thing. Uh, they, they, uh, they, well, it is part of the process of uh, uh, elimination of the culture and the language. Uh, and, uh, but the, it's, the response has been so good. We also, as, uh, we also have to thank James Wheaton, uh, who's very uh, much uh, behind the rejuvenation of wild rice in the, in the modern context. Uh, we, yeah, I appreciate his effort and so on. I wish him well, I wish him uh, uh, um, many more years of activity and so on. I do appreciate his, uh, his contribution. So it's, uh, you asked me a question uh, about how the land would have looked like in the old days. Um, and I, I, I must kind of stress that I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know everything. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, but yet, I guess when I think about it, I'm one of the older ones now in, in Curve Lake. Uh, and I went through a time period in the, in the 40s uh, where I spent a lot of time with the old people. Lucky for me that happened. It, it's, a, it's a big story, it's a long story. But uh, they talked a lot about uh, the land. They talked about uh, how the land uh, provided for them, how the land uh, was beautiful and clean. They always used the word clean in the language. They, they looked at the land with, uh, with great respect and with, with a big thank you, big miigwech, right, all the time. Because they recognize that uh, without that, we would not be here. And, and rice falls into the category of being one of the one of the real special plants that uh, we've been gifted with and that we've honored throughout the years like dorothy said her father was very much a, a thankful individual who paid a lot of attention to to the culture and to the language and to singing and so on uh, that's part of the celebration of, uh, of, uh, of that plant and that you honor this plant and so on. 
But in the old days, uh, this area here, which is a Trent Valley, uh, was very much uh, very uh, full of life, uh, very pristine, uh, very uh, uh, much uh, uh, sustain our people and so on. This was actually where we are today is our summer, uh, 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 wintering ground, sorry, uh, where if our traditional area is the north shore of Lake Ontario and part of the north shore of Lake Erie and so on, and all the tributaries that uh, flow in to, to that, those, those lakes. Now, uh, so we would live by the shoreline in the summer uh, and, and fishing the salmon, the Atlantic salmon that came up, uh, up the St. Lawrence River and up into these tributaries and, and uh, laid the rakes. Uh, our people were, were sustained by this fish for years and years and years sustained by wild rice for years and years and years. Uh, that's who we are. We are the salmon people. We are the rice people. So, what has happened, basically, settlement has made us move from our traditional territory along the shoreline. In traditional, in terms of traditional activity, uh, and then we were made to live on these small plots of land in, in the upper parts of these tributaries. Um, and, uh, and when we were given, uh, by, I use this word reluctantly, given a portion of uh, little bits of land to live on, that was, did not take into account our, uh, our lifestyle, we were quite mobile people. Uh, we were, uh, we lived uh, uh, in uh, sort of like what you would call the modern context tents. Um, and we moved a lot. So we moved from uh, each uh, area within our territory uh, going after food, basically. This up and down the trend system was full of wild rice. Uh, and it was healthy wild rice. And it was big wild rice. That By big, I mean that it, it, today now the wild rice has shrunk into a small little seed. And uh, it, it, it's still good. It's still uh, able to sustain you. But the other ones, uh, we had about four or five varieties of wild rice. Uh, we only have about two left. Um, and we also have a type of wild rice which doesn't produce a seed, believe it or not, which is sometimes 10 feet tall. A lot of people don't know about that rice, uh, uh, but it's, uh, uh, the purpose of it is uh, simply to sustain uh, to put shade on water and to uh, make uh, the water uh, of some of these rivers cool because you need cold water to sustain, sustain, to sustain some fish, particularly the Atlantic salmon needed cold water. It, the, believe it or not, the Trent River system was a cold water system because of all the trees, the big trees and so on, and all the brush that grew on its banks, it cooled the river. Uh, it also, uh, uh, it also uh, uh, over, over time uh, was able to, well, keep itself cool because of, for some reason or another, uh, we would have to thank uh, whomever creates these things that this was done for the salmon, right? That's what we believed, that this uh, 
no. What happened? What happened? Just even pick this one, uh, 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 one fish, the salmon, is that when the settlement started to occur along the trench system, they started to build dams in order to make it easier for lumbering to occur. Uh, and also easy for them to traverse up and down those lakes in their boats. And doing that, they got rid of the ability of the salmon to come up here and spawn. And clear cutting the land, it took all the all the trees away from the banks that heated up the Trent River system. That then there's two things right there, the dam and plus the hotter water uh, prohibited the salmon from coming up these rivers. So it happened quite early. But other rivers within the North Shore of Lake Ontario still continued to sustain the salmon. Uh, famous rivers like the Credit, well, uh, the writers, the documented history talk about uh, talk about um, uh, being able to walk across these rivers because of the number of salmon that were coming up these rivers to spawn. It was so thick. Our people remember those times. So this, when you ask me the question, how was this like? Imagine what it was like. It was a very unbelievably healthy, clean, sustaining, uh, area of the world. Uh, many people over time wanted to take part in the in the use of this land, but we are the indigenous people here. We were created here. We were created here thousands of years ago, uh, before memory. Uh, before even, uh, you know, we're even such people, as spirit people, as that there's not much of a trace of these early, early people in terms of even archaeology. Uh, archaeology starts to appear in the Peterborough area in terms of human evidence around 9,500 years ago. And that's a friend of mine who, is, who did the study on that, uh, a great man. Uh, and found uh, these people lived uh, sustained by the caribou of that time. So uh, we've been here a long time. And, and, and we've had to migrate out here uh, or leave here uh, a couple of times. So we have a migration story. We have a re-migration re story sort of thing. And uh, it goes back, and those, one of these migration stories, in fact, contains the story of how wild rice came here at that time, and how that uh, was a gift in order for us to be sustained, to survive the cold uh, Ontario winter. Uh, it's a storable food. You can you can store it. If you store it in uh, birch bark containers, it'll last forever if you prepare it right. And uh, it sustained our people for a long time. So it has a, uh, by a gift, I mean it's a directly given to us by the spirits, uh, by a manitouk, uh, and, uh, for our use. So it, it's got a spiritual connection. That's why we pray every time we go out and, and pick this. That's why we sing. Uh, we automatically dance to it because by the act of dancing, we clean the rice and so on. It's a very part of us. It's uh, so much part of us that every bone in our body has been, and, and every muscle has been fed by this plant. So it's very much uh, uh, Michisagi Nishinaabeg, uh, sustaining food. Uh, that's all I'll give you at the moment, Leanne. So I know I've rambled on here, but uh, <laughs> we went for that section, for that question. I wanted to start with that question. 
because when I listen to you talk about what our, our homeland used to look like, it's so different than, than what I think I know because those relatives, the caribou, the salmon, and the abundance of rice is not, is not here anymore. And so it was really special to hear about all of the relationality and all of the connectivity of the, the cold water and the, the pine trees sheltering the water, the rice um, shading the water and making it cold for those salmonid fish and how that ecosystem, the water and the land was working together to sustain uh, Michisagi Kineshnabek. It seems, it's unbelievable to me to, I've heard you talk about the thickness of the rice on Shimong Lake, that it, so it was so thick it looked like it was a field and you had to, people had to kind of cut a path for the canoe up the lake. And I remember you talking the other day about how you were scared as a kid paddling around because you couldn't see over the rice. And that's the level of abundance that, um, that I've never experienced in my life. And so when I think about all of those Nishinaabe families coming together in the fall with the elders, with the kids and harvesting over several weeks, you know, pounds and pounds of rice in this like super technologically efficient way of keeping it for the whole winter. It seems like it was such a cornerstone of our, of our bush economy. It was, it was just such a special gift that kept us going when we didn't, when we maybe couldn't find uh, game to eat. Can you talk a little bit about, about sort of the, the way that it um, propelled that, that go around and how important it was as, as a food source and as a, a way of sustaining us through the winter? Okay, um, I remember a couple of times in my own life where, <clears throat> I remember I grew up as a kid in the 1940s. Uh, that was just like uh, coming out of the depression too, right? Everybody was poor and it was like, we didn't have any material things. Uh, we didn't have any money to buy f food from the grocery store sort of thing. So everything came off the land and, and our diet is such that we, uh, we depend a lot upon animals and protein, but at the same time, there has to be something in our diet that is uh, more carbohydrate and, and other things and other small trace mineral uh, sources. And one of them is wild rice. Now that I remember, uh, my grandmother really working hard at getting the rice camp organized. Like every year we went to rice camp. Uh, and I loved that, right? And a whole bunch of kids would get, would be there and our dogs and our cats and a beautiful time of year. Uh, and we would, you know, we would catch fish. Fish was really easy to get. Uh, the bass were lived in amongst the wild rice, and it was so easy. You just dropped into a uh, a frog into a little uh, little hole in the rice, and there would be a bass there. So it was uh, it was almost like uh, you didn't really need to keep the food uh, frozen or 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 even smoked. Uh, it was right there during the summertime, good, good time of year to, to live. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a beautiful time and celebration. The, so we had these camps uh, and we don't do that anymore. Uh, we've lost that over time. I, you know, the emphasis and to, to making a living now have changed so drastically. We, we, uh, we, we've, we've, uh, we've lost the art of living on the land as a Nishinaabe. And so it's, uh, it's, and I think it's very important to try and get that back. 
and there's I love to always stress that because I'm a great believer is that we should get back to making things wild again, if I may use that term, kind of rewild the world because we're moving away to a world of non-sustenance, right? We, we're moving away from being able to have the earth even work for us, like to gift us things. We're going, getting away from that, right? We've forgotten. We've forgotten. And it's not only Nishnabag that I've forgotten. It's the world the, out there, the Western settler world has forgotten where they come from. Uh, they, they depend upon things which I see coming from the background that I've had is not going to sustain them. I can see that very clearly, yeah. but yet it's like, it's one of those things that uh, it's almost like a, like it's driven genetically. It's like, they don't know. And as I hope it's things we're doing today is kind of sends a little spark out there, a little light of how you know, like, hey, let's stop, let's think, let's kind of get some of these things back that help raise our kids into being good human beings. I can still see where we we can do it. I still see a little, it's a little light. I see the little light and I, and a lot of it has to do with the, with uh, with getting back some of the old Mishnah values, uh, it's. I'm not sure that's the question you asked me, Leon. But if uh, you know, uh, I I remember these these beds. I remember looking across uh, Lake, even Pigeon Lake. Uh, we spent a lot of time on Pigeon Lake. I know every little square inch of it. I know what has happened to it with cottagers moving in. There's no regard for for the uh, the importance of the shoreline towards the ecosystem of that lake and of that uh, area. Uh, you know, people are willing to build a cottage right on wetland. Uh, there's other things we're losing, not just rice. We're also losing we can. Uh, Calamus root that used to grow up and down that shoreline at Pigeon Creek. I remember picking it there. Uh, the the cranberry bushes that used to grow along there, along and into Buckhorn Lake and on Scholars Bay. That used to, I remember the cranberries there. There's no more. Uh, so there's no more. Uh, uh, Calamus root is really dwindling. Wild rice is suffering, and it the enemy of the wild rice is really like it, it astounds me sometimes to think that people don't know the importance of this plant and the spiritual importance of this plant. It's very much a ceremonial plant and uh, with long, long history. Why don't people recognize it as a heritage plant and protect it? Why is it not happening? It's almost like they look at it as a invasive weed. Like, come on, like, man. I mean, that's just so insulting. I feel like when I've been with you on Pigeon Lake on the canoe, it's um, it's it's a beautiful experience, but it's also a heartbreaking experience because we'll paddle up to a monster cottage that I won't think twice about and you'll say oh that's where my family used to camp or we'll paddle past well first of all in order to launch the canoe we, we generally have to sneak across someone's lawn or <laughs> sneak off, sneak off somebody's dock 
Um, and then we've come across beds that have been completely destroyed because cottagers are interested in making beaches. Um, so there's all of these little types of things um, that aren't little, but are, are sort of um, pr pretty profound expressions of colonialism. But I'm wondering about that part about that rice camp where you've got large numbers of, of people, lots of families coming together. You said that you remember your grandmother organizing the camp. So there was a lot of leadership from Anishinaabe Kwewak. There was lots of jobs for all the genders because that processing of rice, as all, all of the Anishinaabe know, <laughs> it's easy to harvest it, but the real work comes with the processing. And so we all have bags of harvested wild rice that we never got around to processing in our cupboards. <laughs> and I feel like we're missing this, the communal part of it, where we come together, where we commit to uh, being on a piece of land, camping for a month, working together, uh, singing the songs, doing the dances, having our kids there, having that sense of joy, and also learning how to be with each other, learning how to make decisions, learning how to get along. And I've been thinking a lot about that during the pandemic because so much of our experience now is virtual or on Zoom. There's so, so much less of my life is, I'm so disembodied now, I guess. And so I'm wondering, I'm wondering about, about that, if you can talk about um, how this was in the domain of Anishinaabe women in terms of organizing the camp, um, what we learned about governance and ethics and politics by, by being together, how it's sort of related to the sugar bush in the spring. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. I sometimes wonder about, you know, like I was raised in an extended family situation. Uh, but, you know, like we always leave it up to the, the cultural anthropologist or the sociologist to try and define the way we live, right? Uh, and, it, and there's some confusion if you depend on their analysis. Uh, uh, women were strong. They were the ones who ran the maple sugar bushes, but it's changed over time now. Mostly men that do that now. So one could argue, I suppose, that uh, that settlerism has changed that. Right? Why have we been given some of these women? roles and why did we diminish the woman over time because of that process and I I my grandmother was a, a strong matriarch uh, she organized a lot of that I remember uh, all kinds of the, the men being very dependent on her for leadership and then doing the job the men then would do the men's job but it was always it was always her that directed it in the background. Um, so it's like, what is that? Like, how come anthropologists haven't picked this up? Sort of thing. Uh, and there's, she's not the only one. I mean, there's other families uh, that were led by women. Uh, so it's these very important activities like maple, uh, sugaring, ricing, soccer fishing also is an important one. That in April, when the suckers would first come up the creek, remember we had a tough winter in Ontario. If you live off the land, in the first, when the creeks open up and there the, the sucker would come up, the common sucker. And that's, we pick up on that and that's where we get our food. Uh, for about two weeks, we'd, we'd go and live by the creeks and, and eat. Uh, even the dogs got, got full. Uh, we also had our, we, you know, just at the same time the maple camp hit, the muskrat trapping hit. So it was a kind of a boom situation. Uh, 
at that uh, particular time uh, in the spring and so on. And uh, the women were right there. Uh, and uh, I remember some of the men uh, during that period of time at, on occasion would, uh, they would want to party. And I remember them begging the women for, can you let me have some maple sugar so I can trade it for a little bit of drink. I, I remember those little things. Uh, uh, I remember them then. The question I would ask you, well, she had, she called the shot there. It wasn't them that said, I'm going out to do this. They had to go through her to get the sugar, if you know what I mean. It's, uh, it's a different relationship than we have now. Uh, so women, I'm not, uh, I don't have the ready answers. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just trying to say to you some of the things that I observed. I lived, I lived in that situation where an extended family situation, and it was a, it was a beautifully uh, well-operated uh, way of living. Uh, we didn't, there was always a land that'll provide, and that's the way they thought. And that's what they were grateful for. And the organization was well oiled and beautiful to, to remember, actually. Uh, the work was hard. They always got up before daybreak. Uh, in the wintertime, it seemed like, it, you know, when you got up at five o'clock in the morning in the wintertime, it doesn't get daylight for a couple of hours and it's colder part of the morning, but it's also a good time of day to get uh, to get things like wood believe it or not uh, you gotta get moving you gotta get moving it was beautiful we've talked a lot about how important Minoman is to Anishinaabe I'm wondering if you could talk about how important it is to the black duck and the geese and uh, those relatives of ours that in the fall are getting ready for, for big journeys. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's all kinds of stories in Anishinaabe uh, about, uh, about uh, the animals' relationship to the wild rice. And as much as wild rice was a special gift to Anishinaabe, it was also the duck and the muskrat and the geese especially recognized how much of a gift it was to them. Remember that each of those living plants and animals have a spirit that protects them. They're spirits in, in physical form, right? So those those uh, those animals, particularly the black duck, has a relationship with the with the rice that is kind of an important one. The wild the the black duck is able to find the rice seed in the bottom of the lake, even when it bears itself. The wild rice, when it drops to the bottom has the ability because of the way it's designed to start sinking into the mud. With the wave action, it has these little hairs that work towards getting things. So the duck comes along and, uh, and has to find that seed, right? And it can still, as soon as the lake opens up, it finds that seed. And it takes a lot of doing. If you, you see uh, yourself, uh, you know, we used to laugh at the, at the ducks with their butt 
bum up the air, down diving, looking for wild rice. And the old man used to say, but ah, needs that in order to make eggs. And to make and eggs make little ones, right? So, miyajigisha bought egg, he would say. That's the way life goes in a circle. So that rice is very important to the black duck because it starts the process of making eggs that make children for them. By children, I mean little ducks, ducklings. So it's, 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 everything is dependent on each other. It's a relationship which is symbiotic, it's beautiful, and it sustains life, sustains us. We also, of course, are gifted with eating the duck on the odd occasion. Rice with duck is a stew. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely amazing. The there's lots of um, talk about revitalizing and regenerating ricing. Um, there's different groups planting rice. One of the things that I I know from you that's really important in terms of growing rice and nurturing rice is the water level, and so the water level has to be very particular is that right um and that's something that got really screwed up with the the trans severn waterway system so can you talk about what that water level needs to be at well rice grows in different depths but it can't it can't go it can't grow within water any more than that's deeper than six feet roughly i'm only being rough here there are times when it can grow quite high. This rice that grows uh, on the river system, which is I described to you, which is 10 feet tall, can grow from way down there. Uh, it can go probably even, it can go even 10 feet. Uh, but that's rare. Most of the water level of where rice grows is in the bays. And that rice is anywhere from two feet to four feet in that area. Uh, and, and rice needs, needs that. Pigeon Creek is, is the right depth for that. Um, and it's been for a long time. The problem came when the dams were being built. Uh, and so the, the, the water level became artificial, right? It, be, it man started to control the depth of the water. And one of the things that would happen during that certain time when the rice needs sunlight in order to, to get going in the spring, the water level rose above its growing level so it didn't it had a lot of time i mean uh, there's a lot of uh where be, the water became too deep so the water the people who controlled which is a trend canal system who controlled the water levels didn't know about what you know they don't know what price they don't care and to them, they're happy to control floods, flooding in the spring. Uh, that's because they had generators also along the, along the river system. And doing that kind of thing, they did a lot of damage to, to wild rice. So that's one of the enemies of wild rice is this uncontrolled or controlled by man activity, right? So, but there are other things on the other hand, sort of thing, uh, which our old people used to talk about. When they dammed the river, uh, 
they got they produce more uh, wetland. And sometimes if they would just leave the water alone in the spring, let it just do the runoff from winter, everything would be okay, even with with the dams there. And it, the wild rice would do very well. But um, there was more, there was more uh, area created by the dams in terms of rice to grow in, and it would respond, right? And we had big rice fields uh, even after the dams were built. Then they start fooling around with the water, then they'd kill it, sort of thing. It would back off, and they, it just. Uh, at times, it was a mess. You'd, you'd almost go and beg them to say, leave the water level alone. But then they had boaters, they had cottagers, they had all kinds of people working against them, even today. I mean, that's, yeah. even today, that's what's happening. Is that All these people are interested in getting uh, that uh, plant off the lake. It's it's still battling. Yeah. I have a question about language. So some folks say manomen with the A, and some people say mihnomen with the I. What's the difference between those two? Boy, you're asking me hard questions. Your dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a... I have to interpret this on my own, mm -hmm. right? I was raised with the pronunciation being minomen. Min at the end of a, a, a plant like that means plant or a berry or a fruit. Mm -hmm. So the min is fruit. Min, no, mino means good. Um, so minnow min, literally translated, would mean min, uh, good plant. Manow min. Now, some people argue that because it's, uh, or point out, not argue, but point out that because it's a special plant, it's a spiritual plant, the pronunciation has now become minnow min. Man min. Spiritual plant. Right. But it doesn't say, see, in our, in our language, spirit is manito, manito, right? So it doesn't, manomen, which is supposed to mean spirit, doesn't say manito men. It says menomen. So I'd rather go with the spoken one and say mm -hmm. that means good plant. Okay. It's all right to point out that it is a special plant. It is a spiritually connected plant. So I also like the sound of menom because then we remember that story. We remember that it's spiritual plant. So either one for me works. Good. We're almost at the end of our time, but we have a few minutes before we go to, to the question section. I wanted to ask you, what are your hopes for your, your kids and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren in terms of, of rice and, uh, and harvesting minomen? Yeah, that's... Uh... I think about that, uh, you know, what, what have I done to transfer some of my knowledge to my children? Uh, I, I'm not sure I've kind of transferred enough hand-to-hand -hand, uh, sort of type knowledge, but I think I've given them the base of, of values that would have them honor that. I know uh, my grandson is a racer. Uh, 
uh, and now he's gotten his whole family's mother and dad and sister and uncle and all that stuff uh, doing it. So he's a up and coming wild rice uh, processor. Uh, and he is so lucky to be able to to have that available to him and that he's uh, he's he's gotten to know um, the importance of this plant and i'm not sure i was the one that responsible for that but boy it sure is feels good to observe this um uh, um uh, my other kids have always been interested in, in, in that. Uh, uh, they love to uh, eat Nishinaabe foods. Uh, my children have always enjoyed my cooking, Nishinaabe food, like fish heads and fish innards and fish soup, uh, that kind of food. They, they, they go out of their way to 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 cook it and, 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 and ask me for it. Uh, so we we they 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 do that and but I would still like to think that we in the broader sense that we teach our kids back to the land stuff because then it makes them better human beings. Uh, have a good life. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I just kind of worry that, you know, we're just losing, uh, losing some of the old values. I think those old values sustained us for a long time. Why should we give up on values that sustained us for 10,000 years? When this new one is only 100 years old at best. And we cannot change in midstream, you know, the process. And it's a uh, wish that we would move towards rewilding the whole Nishnabe way. There's a question for you on the, on the chat uh, from Suzanne Smoke. Oh, yeah. Hi, Suzanne. Uh, she, <laughs> hi, Suzanne. She says, Miigwech, Doug, for sharing your knowledge. Will you or will the Minoman group go, are, are you going to be keep having quarterly ceremonies? I feel it in my bones as you say it, in my blood memory, to throw the rice, to dance the rice. It is my obligation. I want to sing for the rice and carry on those songs for the next generation. Yeah, uh, Suzanne Smoke is a very uh, energetic young woman, um, and I really appreciate some of the work that she's done over time. Uh, well, I've, I've, I think I've, I, I'm doing things. I, I, I cannot do sweat lodges anymore. I just, my health won't let me. Uh, I can't go out on the land by myself anymore. I can't go in a canoe by myself anymore. I, I, I've tried. I've gotten into some difficulty. Uh, but I, hopefully I've, I've given enough. I don't have the ceremonies uh, as much anymore. But you know, we recently had uh, uh, a fasting lodge and so on. But I, I, I love more than anything to be able to have a, an area in Ontario, somewhere here, probably just north of Buckhorn or something like that, and try and live off the land and teach the kids to speak the language at the same time. That would be, for me, that would just honor my wishes. Um, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I think, Suzanne, you would have to take it up. I know you do, but it's just, 
we got to put that extra effort into it, and I can't do it anymore, sort of thing. Although, like, I would act as a, a being there for you. I wish you well in your work with Mishnabek, and uh, and some of this, I think, it's also so spiritually driven that it's you've got it genetically. You can do it yourself. And I encourage you to do it yourself. And there are still teachers out there who are, who are available. Yeah. Good luck. Miigwech um, to Yulian uh, and Giga Megazea for what a beautiful uh, and important talk um, this was. I feel truly fortunate to have been here with all of you today. Um, I couldn't agree more with the sentiments that Dorothy um, Gidega Megazea and me shared today. And uh, also hope um, that gathering and sharing our knowledge will reignite that spark that Doug mentioned that we all have inside of us to take care of our environment mm, that's and, right. and to take care of the monomen. Um, there was one question that came in from uh, Janet Tennant, can the wild rice that has been lost be restored? Do old seeds exist somewhere? Um, can I direct this question to um, Gidega Megize? What was the question again? Um, the question was, can the wild rice that has been lost be restored? Do old seeds exist somewhere? Yeah, that is good. Um, you know, that's a good question because the reason it's a good question is that we get criticized for planting it. People, uh, you know, who are of the uh, agricultural uh, paradigm, if you want to call it that, the, the, the settlers who came here were very much agriculturalists, so that they had a one-track mind. And if you plant it, you kind of uh, are nurturing it and promoting it and, and all this kind of stuff. So when they hear of us planting the wild rice, they accuse us of, oh, that's farming. You're making a living. You're, you're, we're not safe. See, First Nation people are not supposed to sell uh, the, the gifts they get from the land. For some reason or other, the settler mind is just abhorred by that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we do plant it. I plant it. Uh, My dad planted it too. Yeah, we we that we've done that forever. Like we'll we'll take yeah. it from one part of the lake to another, uh, because something right. had destroyed it from over there. But yeah. it's it's okay over here. There's seeds left. Uh, uh, people like uh, my grandson and James Wheatung save seeds, um, and if they could be reached, the uh, uh, they can make seeds available to people who want to work with it. We, we actually uh, also send seeds to other areas, just not around here. So if you're from another area and you want to work with this, uh, get a hold of Dorothy. <laughs> For, sure. It's hard to get a hold of me or Leanne or the organizers. Miigwech, Doug. Uh, thank you for yeah. that information. Yeah, there's, there are plenty of resources available. Um, oh, I'll, uh, I think we're at the end of our time now. Just wanted to say Chig Miigwech again to our speakers and to everyone of you for gathering with us today. Um, be sure to tune in to part two of the Pine Tree Talks uh, webinar series. The next episode is uh, titled the Ecology of Monomen. It's airing on November 10th at 7 mm -hmm. p.m. And uh, in closing, I guess I say, may we honor the Monomen, our teachings, uh, each other, and our treaty relationships always.
Naha, miigwech. Hanna gana.